quick look here. I also wanted to highlight you should have just received a message to acknowledge that the meeting is um, going to be recorded so it can be posted um, on the city's website um, for reference for those that aren't able to attend. And I'm just going to go ahead and give it another couple of moments here because I still see um, some folks getting connected. We appreciate everybody taking the time to attend and to participate tonight. And I'm just going to go ahead and give it about 30 more seconds before we launch in uh, just for hopes of uh, any other folks that are trying to get connected to the audio, which I see a couple of names there with a very cute puppy in the picture uh, getting connected to the audio. So, and I'll just give it here another few seconds. So if everyone will bear with me while we're getting set up here, um, if you'll notice on the bottom of your Zoom screen, there are a couple of um, options that are on the screen, which should include your opportunity to raise your hand. Uh, there is also a chat option, which you can also post questions to. And we are also going to be taking some poll questions throughout the discussion as well. And then uh, towards the end of the presentation, we're actually going to uh, open up the floor and uh, ask for some feedback um, in following up from our last community meeting. And I do see it looks like uh, Kiko or K Kayoko is still trying to um, get connected on audio. So hopefully that will come through here. Otherwise, um, I think we're probably in a good place to get started. And my colleague, um, Allison, uh, did just post a comment in the chat that says, if you need any assistance or have any issues, please don't hesitate to post the note in the chat. I also wanted to acknowledge the fact that we do have a Spanish translator available um, for today's presentation as well or any questions that you may have. So um, please don't hesitate uh, to put that request out. Um, Monica, I see that you are on the chat and I'm just gonna go ahead and maybe ask if you wouldn't mind to also announce that that service is available for everybody's benefit. And I'm going to ask if we can unmute Monica, thank you. Hi, uh, good afternoon, or everyone. My name is Monica Espinosa, and I'll be your bilingual translator this evening. Buenas tardes a todos. Mi nombre es Monica Espinosa. Estoy disponible para traducir uh, cualquier preguntas que tengan uh, sobre este taller esta esta tarde. Uh, Thank le, you, Monica. Le, le, I'll ask uh, just the group if uh, if they could write their message as we have in the last workshop in Spanish. Uh, les pido a todos que si tienen uh, Comentario, preguntas o dudas que los escriben adentro en la charla aquí y este yo traduciré uh, uh, las preguntas uh, para para esta tarde. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Está bien. Thank you very much, Monica. So, um, hello everybody. My name is Julie Dixon. I work with Dixon Resources Unlimited. We are the parking consultants that have been retained by the City of Tustin um, to study and evaluate the residential parking program. Uh, before we launch into the tonight's uh, presentation um, and share some information with you, I'd like to hand the floor over um, to um, Chris with the city and allow her to share a little bit about the project and a little bit um, from city staff. Chris? You are muted, Chris. There, there we go. Um, hi, good evening, everyone. Um, I, I see that we have our traffic sergeant here and JJ, who is in our parking enforcement office. Um, and we have a planner here and our PR lady. So um, we have some folks here from the city in case there are questions that come up that you know are um, related to what they take care of. Um, I'm, I am Chris Aldevar. I'm a public works transportation manager here at City of Tustin. I also handle the um, parking uh, requests for um, actually just get, getting the parking, uh, permit parking in your neighborhood. Um, we've hired Dixon to come up with a, hopefully an up, update to our po policy that's outdated at this point, um, given some of the, um, again, some of the things that are coming down from up north. 
So uh, we're here to listen um, and as much as we can, we'll, ho we'll hopefully get some kind of consensus at the end of this that we can present to council as far as what that update of the policy will look like. Um, I'll hand it back to uh, Julie, but uh, thank you again for coming tonight um, and taking time to do this with us. Great, thank you so much, Chris. And again, I really appreciate everybody taking the time out of their schedules to participate on this evening. So as I mentioned, we're actually going to do just a brief presentation. I think most of you know that we did a public survey um, during the summer and we wanted to share some of those results with all of you. But we are also going to be conducting some live polling to get some of your direct feedback. And I was hoping my colleague Allison wouldn't mind giving some of the instructions uh, regarding how that polling process will work. Allison, would you mind to share? Of course. So as we get to the polling questions, there are seven groupings of questions. Um, you're going to get a pop up on your screen and you're gonna select the answer. The questions are both in Spanish and English, except for the last one in which the questions will be in the bubbles on the screen in Spanish and English. Um, select the answer that works best for you, whether you support or are against certain things, um, if you're a permit holder or not a permit holder. Um, a lot of these questions were also asked in the survey, but we wanna make sure that we give opportunity to everyone to be able to answer these questions. Great, thank you, Allison. And again, be mindful um, to please feel free to use the chat. We will try to respond to questions as they are posted, um, but we'll definitely be sure to try to tackle everything uh, before we leave today's meeting. So with that, uh, we're gonna go ahead and jump right in and get started. And I'm gonna ask my colleague if she could advance the screen. So just a little bit about uh, Dixon Resources Unlimited. Uh, we work with communities all across the country, especially here in Southern California. And we actually have projects that are very similar to the one that we're working on in Tustin, also in Costa Mesa, as well as Norwalk. Um, the challenges of residential parking and residential parking permit programs is one that has definitely been evolving um, over uh, the last decade plus, especially as the housing um, impacts have really evolved in Southern California. And tonight we'll talk a little bit about some of the legislation that's also pending in California too with those impacts. So next slide. So tonight's meeting, uh, what we thought we'd do first and foremost is talk about the project objectives and the timeline. And again, making that commitment of when we're looking to report out to city council and uh, taking those recommendations forward. I think it's gonna be really important and I'll highlight this on the next slide is when we talk about the next round of community feedback where we'll bring the recommendations uh, that are being considered uh, forward for community review uh, well before we go to city council as well. So I think that's something that I really can't emphasize enough is how important your feedback as residents um, is throughout this entire process. We wanna make sure that we're um, providing a solution that's gonna be very realistic and work for the city of Tustin and the community that lives there. And so that also um, incorporates any improvements or changes to the parking permit program, as well as tonight we'll be going through the parking survey highlights and some live polling as Allison mentioned. And at the very end of tonight's conversation, we'd like to save some time to hear directly from you where some of you who maybe attended the last meeting might recall that we did the parking magic wand exercise with the intent of hearing from you if you had a parking magic wand and you could change, fix, or improve anything about parking in Tustin, what would it be? So if you'll give some thought to that, we'll definitely have that conversation uh, towards the end of tonight's discussion. So next slide. Just real quick yes. before you continue, uh, I did hear that a couple people were not able to see the presentation. I just wanna make sure that everyone is able to see it. So if you are not able to see it, can you click on the reactions and give me a crying face so I know that some people are having issues still or if it's general. Or just yeah. raise your hand of some kind as well. Oh, I see some crying faces from Chris actually. Anybody else? Okay, thank you. We just wanted to make see if it was isolated or not. Thank you, Julie, you can continue. Okay. Great, thank you very much. And that's exactly the kind of feedback we need to hear because we wanna make sure that everybody uh, gets to see and hear all of the details that we're sharing uh, this evening. So when we talk about the parking study objectives, I think it's really important. You see number one there is actively engaging stakeholders. Having you all being involved and giving your feedback is really an important aspect, again, because we wanna make sure that we have a very realistic solution 
Um, we did have the good fortune of being able to go on a ride along um, with uh, the police department to be able to go out um, over the graveyard or overnight shift to be able to see what the impacts were uh, for parking so that we can look at this holistically. I think that that's something that's really important is that when we talk about um, the challenges and needs, is that this really involves all of the community members and basically everyone that lives within the city. And I think that that's important because, you know, historically programs that are basically built to potentially protect single family resident neighborhoods versus multifamily resident neighborhoods. Those are the things that have really evolved and changed. And um, there's actually some legal opinions that have basically really led to this discussion today. And I'll share more about that as we go through. Looking at the efficiencies and effectiveness of the residential permit program as they stand today, what can be done in the future, and ultimately uh, developing recommendations um, that can have an immediate impact on the parking operation as a whole. So that really sums up the objectives of the project. And if we go to the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about the timeline. So for those of you who attended the last meeting, you might be familiar with and recognize we actually launched this project before um, shelter in place occurred. So uh, that's when we had actually gone and done the ride along and uh, had really just launched the program with city staff. And um, as a result of the pandemic, we actually slowed the project, stalled the project and put a, um, a pin in it for a bit. Um, because I think all of us can appreciate um, the pandemic shelter in place for how long it was supposed to last versus the reality of what all of our lives are today. And so by doing some adjustments to that, we were able to um, conduct the operational needs assessment, which really went out and looked at the resources that the city's using today to manage parking, as well as the number of personnel. And also importantly, doing what's called the comparable cities analysis, where we actually look at similar cities to Tustin and looking at how they're managing and operating their residential parking permit programs, fees they're charging, uh, hours of operation, inspection policies, really getting into the weeds of the program. And just this last spring is when we basically relaunched the project. And that's when you saw the previous, um, the online study and uh, basically doing the surveying as well as the last community meeting. And right here, we're basically here to share those survey results. And then those next steps will basically be returning to you um, at the end of October. In fact, on October 28th, to share with you um, the proposed recommendations for the residential parking permit program and the residential parking policy needs, and then ultimately presenting to council uh, late this year, early next year um, with that final feedback, especially based upon community um, feedback to that process. So next slide. So the considerations of what's really kind of bubbled up, and this really comes as a result of that needs assessment, the policy comparisons, as well as the feedback from the community. Uh, one is something we call a virtual permit program, which is basically automating the permit process where you can basically apply online, uh, submitting your credentials as applicable, and being able to do your validation processes um, basically all virtually and ultimately having it be a license plate based system. This is something that's really kind of a consistent model that's being done throughout the country now in order to bring as much automation and efficiency to the program and allowing you know, the majority of folks to be able to manage their parking permits honestly via their cell phone. So that's a nice convenience that can come across with that process. Being able to optimize the petitioning process is something um, to be able to really be evaluated throughout this process is something that needs to be considered. And also importantly is the cost to administer a program. One of the things that's important about any parking management solution is you want to ensure that it at least is a sustainable solution and can support the technology and the administrative oversight necessary for a program. So we need to make sure that those cost efficiencies are put into place and making sure that the permits are rated at a place that is going to help pay for the system. Looking at something that's called bundled versus unbundled parking requirements, that might be a term that's not familiar to you, but this is something that's important when we start to talk about um, multifamily dwellings or new housing developments and making sure that whatever the parking requirements are associated with those developments and what the rates for parking are and if they're included in the rent or not included in the rent, that's basically what bundled versus unbundled means. And that's something that's gonna be really important when we start to talk about multifamily dwelling impacts versus single family dwelling impacts in our neighborhoods. 
But I also have to take this little side note and highlight the fact that um, I think for those of us that were born and raised in Southern California can appreciate the fact that many of our single family homes and maybe what they were designed or built for, um, those traditional means have necessarily changed. And in some cases, we maybe have multiple families living in single family homes. And I think that that's just the reality of the world that we're living in. And so maybe the way that our garages that have been turned into housing units or ADUs, accessory dwelling units, again, these are all things, as Chris mentioned, you know, coming down from the state legislature, that's really causing the impacts that are happening in our neighborhoods. I like to mention that because of the fact that I think that it is the reality of the times that we're living in and the fact that the laws are changing to allow for those types of developments and those types of housing allowances. And those are things that are obviously impacting our city streets. And so I wanna make sure that I mention that so that when we talk about the program, we can be very realistic in the fact that these are the details that we are working with. We will consider the maximum number of parking permits that are allowed um, for a parking permit program. And also really talking about um, the zone rules that would be associated with specific neighborhoods and neighborhoods that potentially want to participate in a program versus maybe locations that don't necessarily need parking permit locations any longer. We'll also talk about the neighboring city impacts and the fact that we have neighboring cities that also have spillover into our neighborhoods and we definitely want to dive into that as well. When we talk about the number of permits, we want to talk about what are called escalated permit rates, where maybe the first parking permit for a residence is a low affordable cost, but for second, third, and potentially fourth vehicles, that those rates can be escalated in order to encourage folks to be able to use their driveways or their designated parking locations. And I mentioned the state legislature and the AG stands for attorney general opinion. Um, in 2016, the attorney general published an opinion that basically indicates that municipalities cannot discriminate between multifamily versus single family homes when it comes to residential parking permit programs. And it's one of the main causes too for this evaluation of this program is to make sure that there's equity, equity in this program and making sure that everybody is treated accordingly and fairly. And then uh, if you listened in on one of the previous meetings, we're also diving into shared parking agreements, which is basically an opportunity to hopefully take advantage of maybe some private property locations in some of our more densely impacted neighborhoods and being able to identify locations where potentially using private locations for overnight public parking is absolutely one of the means that we're looking to um, delve into. So um, with that, I'll just take a pause because I wanted to make sure I know we've had a couple of folks um, joining in and Allison has put a couple of comments in the chat box. I just wanna make sure everybody knows that we're gonna go through some information first. The chat box is open, so you're welcome to post any questions and we're gonna be starting our polling in just a moment as well. So we're happy to have you here this evening. So next slide, please. So let's talk about the survey. Um, as I mentioned, uh, the survey was actually open this summer and was actually open for the entire month of July. And we actually had over 1,100 responses. I have to tell you, I've been doing this for quite some time and that is a very solid number, which is really something that makes us very happy because when you have that many responses, it really is a good representation for the community and making sure that we have excellent um, results and feedback. So we wanna make sure that we're hearing from as many people as possible, especially as we delve into the details of some of the questions that were asked. So if we can dig into those details, next slide, please. So as we mentioned at the beginning, um, an online poll is going to pop up on your screen. There's going to be two questions that are asked. And in this case, it'll be listed in both English and Spanish. And the two questions that are going to be asked are the first is which of the following best describes where you live? And the second is if you, if not a single family house, how many units are in your complex? So Allison, if you wouldn't mind posting that poll if everybody could take a moment to respond to the poll. It does look like we have a timer on that. And so uh, I'll have to ask Allison, how much time, Allison, just so it's, I'm familiar. It's not counting down, it's counting up. So I'll I, just watch, I, I'll watch to see. We have okay. 27 people here, about five of them are uh, Steph and Dixon. So we will wait till we get a few more answers. 
Sounds good. We didn't talk about the timer, so I didn't want to cut anybody off in regards to that. So I did not know that would be there, but it's luckily counting up and not counting down. All good. So it's looking like um, would the multifamily, multi dwelling ho home be considered other? Question um, I would say for a multifamily dwelling um, where you have more than one family in a single family. I would consider that to be a single, if it's a, if it was designed and built as a single family home, I would probably check single family home, but you're welcome to select other, whichever one you think best fits or best describes your residence. Good question. So it's looking like I'm starting to see the polls um, kind of die down. So if we take a look, you can see they're on the screen that, or well, actually if you hit end yeah, poll, display, it. right? There we go, it's sharing. Thank you, Allison. So we can actually see from the participants um, for tonight's meeting, it's actually a pretty um, even count there for 29% uh, for single family, 29% for condominiums, and then we've got 21% for townhomes, 14% for apartments, and 7% for other. And then if not a single family home, how many units are in your complex? And I can see that 43% um, have 51 plus or more. We've got 29% that don't know and 29% uh, that have two to nine. And this is gonna be where the test is gonna be because I know the next slide is gonna tell me um, what kind of representation that we have. So I'm going to, am I hitting stop sharing, Allison, or are you? It should be gone for you now. I hit stop sharing. Okay, great. You have so, for yourself. Great, if we can go to the next slide then please. So these are the actual results from the survey that had over um, 1100 folks responding. And you can see that 58% uh, of the respondents lived in single family homes. And we had 52% who lived in multifamily homes and complexes uh, with complexes with more than 51 units. So I think that the representation that we have on that second question is pretty equitable to what we had in the survey. And then during the survey, it seemed that we had a good majority of folks that lived in single family homes that did respond. We can go to the next slide, please. It'll be our next survey question, which says, do you live on a street with a preferential permit parking requirement? If we could post that poll. And if you could all take the um, poll, please or the survey. And it looks like we've got the about the same number of folks that responded the last time. And so if we can end the poll, please. We'll see that um, the majority of folks attending tonight do not live on a preferential permit parking uh, location that has requirements. So we'll go ahead and move on to the next slide, please. So we can see that again, consistent with the responses on the survey, those numbers are a pretty good representation of uh, exactly what we had here tonight, where 71% of the respondents do not live on streets with preferential permit parking requirements. If we can go to the next slide. So the next poll question is, how many parking permits are currently issued to your household? And I'll say if applicable, so we can post the slide, please. And so for those of you that don't have it, you would fill out NA for not applicable, if you can go ahead and respond. Great, if we could go ahead and end that poll. We can see that with the numbers, again, the majority being not applicable, and it looks like two um, has the majority there on the 15%. So if we could go ahead and go to the next slide and see the results from the actual survey. And we can see that the majority, it's actually a pretty decent split there where we can say 34% um, that don't typically need a permit. And in their case, the majority on their side had um, the one permit or that the 45% the of the respondents who live on streets that have parking permits uh, typically have one. So I'd say um, that's a good result there. If we can go to the next slide. So the next poll is, and thank you all for participating in these polls. Um, how many vehicles does your household have in Tustin? So regardless of parking permits, 
How many vehicles are associated with your household will be the first question. And then the second question is, how many on-site parking spaces does your household have available at your home? So meaning, how many cars can you park basically off street associated with your household? So we'll post that question for those two. see about five more people to respond. Nope, three more. It's climbing. Just give it another moment here. Okay, why don't we go ahead and end that poll. And we can see that the majority, um, more than half, have two vehicles. And the second question was how many on-site parking spaces? And the 50% majority have two. So that's actually a good match because uh, that shows that we're pretty close on the number of spaces available versus the number of cars that you have. We can go to the next slide. And so that we can look at, again, our numbers look like they're fairly consistent with what the poll results were and that we can see that the majority definitely has uh, two vehicles and they're on the right side. It does look like we've got a good number of that have four uh, on-site parking spaces eligible as well. So that we can see that the highlight is 95% of the permit eligible households and 88% of the non-eligible permit households have two or more vehicles and that 94% of permit eligible households and 83% of non permit eligible households have two or more on site parking spaces. So those numbers look like they're a pretty close match um, to hopefully be able to offset the impacts on street. Next slide. So the next question is, when do you typically find it difficult to find parking on your block either side of the street and select all boxes that apply. So Allison, if you could um, post that poll. And if we could all respond to that survey. A couple more to respond. And Dixie, I do see your comment. We will come back to that here after we respond uh, to this poll. And it looks like we've got a good response so we can end that poll, please. So we're seeing here, it's looking like evening followed by overnight um, being the most impactful in terms of uh, difficulty to find parking followed by the afternoon. Uh, if we could go to the actual uh, poll results from the survey. Next slide, there you go. And so uh, we're seeing evening followed by overnight. And let's see, the next one looks like afternoon and overnight um, being the most consistent. Again, uh, depending on permit versus non-permit locations, the non-permit locations, obviously the evening and overnight being the most impactful. Um, so Dixie, I see that you and Wes concurs that the problem is that there is never room for car two due to too many people who do not live on the street parking there or other people on the street not using their garage. We'll definitely tackle that during uh, the discussion coming up as well. So next slide. So another poll question, how far from your home do you typically have to park if we could post that poll? If you could all respond to that question. We've got several answers on there on my block, a block or two away, a few blocks away, a significant distance away. This rarely occurs on my block, being not applicable or not applicable, I don't know, I do not use street parking. Just a couple more to respond. Great, if we could go ahead and end that poll. So from the results, it looks like about a third of you are able to park on either side of your block. And then uh, we have a, 
uh, tie for 21% on a significant distance away versus I don't use street parking. And then it looks like a pretty equal distribution for a block or two away versus a few blocks away uh, versus 5% of you saying this rarely occurs on my block. If we could go to the poll results, please. And if we can see on my block, we can see from the darker blue being the permit holders um, are able to park on their block by about 42, 43%. And then um, we can see for the non-permit holders that that is just over um, right at about 27%. And then we've got a pretty good chunk of folks just over 25 that do not use street parking. Um, so I think that I'm just comparing the two. Um, it looks like our numbers are fairly consistent um, in terms of the representation of what we had there. I think we've got a little bit higher on the significant distance um, compared to what we have here tonight as well. So if we can go to the next slide. And then if we, this is the one where Allison mentioned that uh, from the Spanish translation will not be on the full question. Um, and the, the preface of this one is to balance the needs of all residents, the city may consider adjustments to the city's existing preferential permit parking program. Please help the city understand your residential parking priorities by rating your support for the following options. And I'll go ahead and read these questions as the poll is posted. We have expand the preferential permit program to include additional public residential streets where permit holders can park. Expand the preferential permit program citywide to include all blocks with house, housing fronting public streets. Adjust eligibility requirements to allow all Tustin residents within a specific zone to participate in the preferential parking permit program and eliminate the preferential permit program altogether. So, Allison, if you could post that poll. We'll go ahead and give everybody a moment. And we'll give everybody a couple extra moments on this one because there are four questions on this one. We'll just give everybody another moment or two here. It's looking like we're still seeing the polling fill up. Maybe a chance to give one or two more people a chance to respond. Okay, Allison, why don't we go ahead and close that poll and if we can move on to the next slide, we will look at the results uh, compared to what we have here today. So in totality from the um, online survey results that were completed with the 1100 responses, you can see that the results were split um, mostly throughout. And I'm just gonna go ahead and look at the results as they compare to what we did here today. Um, so to expand the preferential permit program to include additional public residential streets where permit holders can park, uh, we do have 53% that said they support it. And then we have an even split of being neutral and do not support that as well. And then moving down into expand the preferential permit program citywide to include all blocks with it with housing fronting public streets. And in this particular case, we did have 65% support, 29% do not support, and 6% that we're not sure. Moving into the next question, um, adjust eligibility requirements to allow all Tustin residents within a specific zone to participate in the preferential parking permit program. And this one we had 65% support, 18% do not support, 6% being neutral and 12% being not sure. And the last question was eliminate the preferential parking permit program altogether. And our poll here during the meeting was 76% said do not support 
and 12% evenly said that they were neutral or support that initiative as well. So I'm um, just looking at those numbers as they compare to on the poll, um, just looking at this um, for the responses, it's looking like a pretty fair representation with, like I said, the, even, the evenness of the split. So that'll be something that to be able to evaluate as well as we go through it, if we can go to the next slide. So this is where now we will start to turn the transition of the conversation over to you. And this was the mention that I had made earlier was that um, if you had a parking magic wand, you could change, fix, or improve anything about parking in Tustin, you know, what would you use it for? Uh, what we'd like to do is leverage the hand raise um, notion so that we can um, be able to uh, call upon you and be able to hear your feedback as well. So uh, I see uh, John, you have um, ra raised your risen your hand, raised your hand. So I'm going to ask if you can unmute yourself. And John, if you can hear us okay. Uh, I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can, if you could go ahead and tell us uh, how, well, if you could tell us when you do start off, maybe just your affiliation with um, Tustin, maybe how long you've lived there. And then yeah. if you wouldn't mind telling us uh, what you would use your magic wand for. Yeah, so my name's John. I represent Sycamore Gardens. For the last five years, I've been trying to get permit parking for our residents, the public works and, and you guys. Uh, the last data set, um, I did notice it wasn't filtered by single family homes and multifamily homes. Um, the general consensus with single family homes is they don't have a parking problem to begin with. They just don't want people outside of their community parking on their streets. So I think that one should be readjusted and filtered based on single family and then the other types of categories that you have. Because if 60% of the homes are single family, of course, they're going to want to get rid of the program if they can't put eight cars on their street. So, so anyways, on, on my topic... Um, I have an issue. My biggest concern is going to be the approval process because when I was denied in 2018, um, the single family homes on the other side of our property were approved. Their parking ratios were 2.12 per house. And then when we tried to get it, ours is 0.53. And the problem is, and for some of these units, you know, there's two or three of them that have six or seven cars when they're doing the study they're gonna use those high influx units against us. So, so that's, you know, that's why I've been trying to get, you know, sent you guys emails and questions about, hey, you know, how is it that half a block away, there's a parking problem, but then on my street where, sorry, let me start over. On single family homes, they got permit parking. There was parking all the way up to two in the morning. And that's why everybody went there. On my street, Five years ago, when I started this process, it would fill up by 5 p.m. Now it fills up by 1 p.m. And there's multiple cars with out-of-state plates, expired tags. The single-family homes right next to me, there's three of them that work on cars. And so they put all their hobby cars on the, on the, the following street, Sycamore. So, so there's definitely a lot of questions to still be answered because if we're doing a holistic approach, then that would mean that the single family home parking is gonna get absorbed into the other streets. Or if we're talking about overflow, the parking that's on your floor, then we should have the same you know, convenience of, hey, we have 63 spots and 100 units. Having one or two permits, having people being able to actually park in front of their home is gonna cause those cars to not overflow and in this situation, it's not gonna allow somebody to move in, buy a unit, and then have 10 cars displacing the other residents who are gonna to go to other communities. So, so I think there isn't a magic wand, I'm just trying to figure out the details because there's so the other cities don't use a parking ratio. Orange has, if 75% of the street is filled up at any time of the day, then they're approved. So, so really if the magic wand here is hard hard caps, because even if you have a single family home, two more than two cars on a public street is overflowing into another person's home. I don't, I don't know very few homes that are big enough to have more than two cars in front of their house. So, right. um, so that, that's all. I'm just no, gonna- John, I, pre I appreciate that. And I think one of the things that I, I hope you were here from the beginning, I wanted to make mention of is 
that comparable cities analysis in terms of how other agencies evaluate and measure is definitely part of that assessment as well um, for that consideration. I also think it's important um, only because you brought up a couple of points. Um, I wanna make sure we, met, we mentioned earlier that we have um, some state legislation that's in process right now. <clears throat> and some of you may or may not be familiar with it, um, but there's an assembly bill right now that for example, with new developments, it would waive parking restrictions if it is within a half a mile of a transit stop. And so that really is a game changer when we talk about the impacts on our streets. And I think that that's something that we need to all be mindful of, um, you know, being residents of California, is that these are decisions that are also coming at the state level that will then trickle down to the cities and the neighborhoods that you all live in. So I just, I like to share that with people because those are things that not often everybody's aware of. Um, but that, when I talk about the housing crisis, that's the impacts that are basically starting to affect, you know, agencies and communities like yours too. Of so, course. And, yeah. and all, all I really want is to play by the same rules as single family homes. If you're yeah. gonna treat that parking as their parking, we, we have enough parking in front of our houses and, and to not have any kind of limitations. And I, I've been showing proof, like I'm sure you got some of my emails and photos, mm -hmm. like I, I just, it's insanity. I just, I just wanna play by the same rules as everybody else and not, not right. have, let's have these rules for single families and let's have these homes for condominiums because we're, we're property owners. Like right. we are property owners, we can't move. We don't have a lease that at the end of the year we can we can move to another city that has more parking. You know, right. some of us have 20, 30 years, you know, living here. So thank you very much. No, I appreciate it. I also wanted to touch on you mentioned a couple of other things, and those are items that we can highlight too, is the aspects of like you said, vehicles with expired tags, on um, factors, you know, people working on their cars in the street. The one thing I want to highlight, and I'm not looking to make excuses, but I also want to be very realistic about this is. Um, throughout the pandemic, there were certain waivers that were allowed in California, and I'm not, you know, I'm not questioning the tags, mind you, but and when it came to expired registration, I think it's the only time in my lifetime where California basically said you could have an expired tag. It was only supposed to be for a certain number of months, but I will tell you that many agencies are still um, dealing with the ramifications and kind of catch up process with that as well. And we are also looking at the resources that are allocated um, for the monitoring um, of the program as well. I think it's important to understand that obviously our public safety departments are overwhelmed with, you know, like life saving public safety issues as well. And oftentimes parking um, doesn't obviously hit the top priority all the time. Um, and I'm not making that as an excuse. It's just- No, I understand. Priority, so, and, and that's yeah. why LPR, you know, scanners yep. can do most of this work, but- but also in the city of Tustin, I mean, you can also make it so that 72 hour ordinances aren't a, to you know, aren't, aren't immediately a towable offense. Because yep. if they get a ticket after 72 hours, that's a bigger motivator than, oh, my car gets towed after six days. And that's why it's, it's a joke. And then the police department gets inundated with calls about the same car and, and there, it's not dissuading them. And that's why there's, yep. It's crazy to me that there's a hobby school bus right in front of Sycamore Magnet Academy. Like, th this is obviously a hobby vehicle. It's being stored right next to a school. And it's kind of shady that a school bus is not being used to transport kids. No, I appreciate it, John. Well, thank you so much for All tonight right. and for your feedback. And again, we'll definitely even thank you for the emails as well. We'll definitely leverage those. I'm gonna go ahead and mute you and I'm gonna to go to Kenneth. And Kenneth, I'm gonna unmute you and lower your hand. And if you wouldn't mind, uh, Kenneth, if you wouldn't mind sharing with us uh, yourself and maybe your affiliation, uh, how long you've been in Tustin and share with us what you would use that magic wand for. All right, thank you, Julia. I appreciate your thoughtfulness and, and the opportunity. Um, I've lived in Tustin for almost 25 years. Um, I purchased, um, I'm an original, I purchased um, a home in the Presidio community development. Actually, I purchased the very last one. It was the parking lot for the model. Um, and my home, like many of them in that development, um, does not have a driveway. It has like a half a driveway. I think it's about a third of the homes that were built. Um, so it was really, it was really overbuilt. Um, and it's highly restrictive. You have to park, of course, your two car. You can have up to two cars if they fit in your, in your garage. If 
If you have more than two cars, well, then you're permitted to park in your driveway if you have one. Residents are not permitted to park on any of the streets in the community. Even outside of the area, um, like uh, up and down Pioneer Road, anywhere from Jamboree all the way down to Tustin Ranch, you know, past um, Pioneer Elementary, uh, um, not Pioneer, um, uh, the elementary school there, um, Peters Canyon Elementary School, you're not permitted to park on either side of that street. So we don't have any city permit program at all. This is a problem because when people move in, like we did 25 years ago, uh, we had one child who was one, uh, and then we had another child. Um, um, one went to college, law school, she lives out of town now. The other one is in college and was going to Irvine Valley College. Well, what do you do with their cars? Even when they come back to visit, it's, it's a real problem and it's really forced a number of families to actually, they're actually forced to consider selling their homes and moving. Um, one thing that's really interesting to me though is when, when it's not just the Presidio, but all of the adjacent communities there, whenever uh, our streets are being repaved or resurfaced, everybody is allowed to park on Pioneer Road up and down on both sides. There's not a problem when people park there. I mean, perhaps you know the corner should be painted red so no one parks near near the end. But this is a huge problem. Forget about guests coming over and you contact the homeowners association. We have somebody who's going to come over and you know and, and you, you get a, a permit for you know two nights or three nights. Um, but it's just really impacted. Um, I don't see why there cannot be uh, a permit that why there cannot be permit program consideration for all of those communities there, even if it's just to allow parking on one side of Pioneer Road, although I don't see any problem with parking both sides. And we're talking about preferential parking or maybe exclusively for residents, uh, perhaps even limiting it to um, two cars if you don't have a driveway. I mean, anything that's reasonable. Um, it's a huge problem. Um, and it's, I don't know why this part of the community is not even considered for any sort of permit program. Now, I appreciate that. I was also going to ask, and forgive my, infamiliar, my unfamiliarity, there's a park there, uh, correct? And I'm just wondering, do you also have any spillover effects um, for folks maybe going hiking or using the trails at all? Well, there, there, there is no overnight parking permitted anywhere on Pioneer Road. Um, there's no overnight parking permit on any of the streets where our communities are. Um, um, there's, you know, people can park near the, um, Peters Canyon Elementary School, if they're gonna go walk and hike, you know, up you know, Peters Canyon, um, the little wilderness area there. Um, but I, you know, and I, I know that there are bike lanes on both sides of a Pioneer Road, um, but I, it, I, I cannot see why at least one side of that street cannot be um, considered for a permit parking program for residents. Uh, it's just not reasonable for homes that have three, four, and five bedrooms that you can only have two cars. There's nowhere you'd have you'd have to you'd have to drive miles to find a place to park a car overnight. Great. Okay. No, this is thank you for that. We'll definitely take note of that. And I'm also I'm gonna make sure to um, I'm trying to figure out else. And the one thing is to be able to get everybody's email address too to be able to. Um, I'm trying to, I'm going to come back to you also on that. So that, that way we can also follow up as needed um, with folks. So I know that we've created a user list, I believe that we've referenced from the previous community meeting. So I'm going to come back to you on that one, Allison. So um, Kenneth, we'll definitely look to follow up with you as well, but uh, we'll thank you for sharing your feedback tonight. Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate thank it. You. I'll send my email address to you as well. That'd be great. Thank you so much. Appreciate it.
So I know Chester, you were next, um, and I know I see other hands. So I'm going to ask Chester if you could unmute um, yourself. I are you able to? There we go. Can you hear go me? ahead, Chester. Yes. Great. Uh, uh, Lynn and I have been living in this house for 37 years. We moved in here. We live in a in uh, Cala in California. I mean Cala and California Street, which is just off McFadden. Uh, this is a community of 87 houses, and somehow or the other we got restricted parking. What for? I don't know. To start off with, none of us had any say in this. But our streets are restricted. I don't know why. We don't have a problem with parking. We just have two cars, my I wife and I. But on weekends, <laughs> we have you know visitors coming, that kind of stuff. And there's, and, no, parking. And there's no parking. That's one of the problems. And uh, what has changed? I don't know. What is the city doing? I don't know. The city has, in the last maybe 15 years, allowed uh, uh, units to be built around um, on Irvine, near the, hospital. Yeah, near the hospital. There's a near unit the built hospital. over there with just two parkings for each of the units. That whole street is packed. You can't even move there. Why did the city allow this? The city is not doing its job on controlling the parking. We, next to our house along on the other side of the street, there are resident, um, um, they are uh, renters. renters. There's lots of rental units and there's hundreds of them around that area. And there's no, there's no regulation as far as street parking. And it's an absolute mess. We need to try and see to it that we don't allow these buildings to go up, number one. Number two, someone has to do something about it. I, I once, uh, I took some students to JPL and it was a rental unit that I had. I put my sticker on the car. It was like 10 at night I came in. I put the sticker on the car. It dropped like an inch lower and I got a ticket and they refused to change it. So, you know, this, this, the, the, this, this whole thing about uh, certain streets were just chosen to have restricted parking has to be re-evaluated. Uh, and I, I wanna assure you, Chester, that's actually part of this process is really kind of the overhaul of the program. Um, and that's really the core intent of it. And I do want to just on your first comment there um, on kind of your summation, I do wanna reemphasize that the at the state legislature level, um, there is an assembly bill currently pending right now, it's assembly bill 1401. And if it is passed in its current state, it basically will eliminate any parking minimums for new developments within a half mile of transit district or a transit stop. And I say that because um, I, I appreciate your concern about like not building but I want to just highlight the fact that right now at our legislative level, they're looking at trying to build more residential and not requiring any parking. So I'm not saying that to in, in, incite anyone. I'm just telling everybody that that is um, where that stands. And so to be able to speak to your representatives about that as well as something I would encourage you all to be sure to be aware of that too. So um, we'll take note of the location. Thanks for sharing the street names and we'll definitely follow up. And I wanted to highlight in the chat, um, you can send your email address to Allison. Uh, her name is in there as one of the hosts. And uh, she can also take note of your uh, contact information so that we can also uh, follow up or um, make further inquiries as we're going through this process. So Chester, thank you so much for sharing. I appreciate um, uh, for how long you've lived in Tustin and to give your feedback to us is appreciated. So thank you very much. I'm going to go ahead and uh, put you on mute. And our next person I see is Toby. And Toby, I'm going to try to unmute you now. And there you go. Can you hear us okay? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you very much. Yep. Um, my name is Toby Moore. I'm a 20-year resident of Tustin. I live um, across from Nelson School in a small cul-de-sac. Um, so the street I'm on, single family home, is near a considerable amount of multifamily homes as well as, as overflow from the school during the day. 
I was very vocal in 2007 when this program, the, the first preferential program was put in place. Part of my concern at the time was not allowing for each single family home to have at least one or two parking permits. And the result I predicted would be that you would have overflow as you added streets into this program onto adjacent streets. And that's what we've seen. It's just been a hopscotch effect. Uh, the majority of, of the residential streets near my home have preferential parking. And so our street is heavily impacted. It's, it's very difficult to park on our street. Uh, was not the case for the first several years uh, that I lived here, but now it is, it is a considerable problem. Um, I think it's reasonable to, to have at least one or two per, per each single family home. And so with that, I would recommend that. Also, there should be a consideration for company vehicles. Um, uh, I have a company vehicle, it's registered to my company. Uh, that currently cannot be considered as, as part uh, of a vehicle in, in a preferential parking area. And I'm a, an emergency responder. So I need that vehicle to, to be available. Then in one point I, I want to point out, at the same time in 2007, when the preferential parking permit came in, several ordinances were updated. One was re related to uh, garages within single family homes, largely because it was in, in connection with uh, ensuring that folks were using their garages for uh, parking. But at the same time, it, it didn't acknowledge that um, you need to have ingress and regress to that garage. And so this preferential permit system required you to maximize your parking, which meant that if you had two cars in your garage, you also had to fill in your, your driveway before you get a permit, um, which actually uh, um, is against the need of having that ingress and regress to, to get a vehicle out uh, and, and into your garage. So I would change that uh, if I had a magic wand. And with that, uh, those are my comments. Thank you. And Toby, if I could just ask you a couple of questions, especially relating to the company vehicles. Um, the, uh, so when you say a company vehicle, this could just be a sedan, but it's registered to, you know, Acme company versus like the plumbing truck that's registered to Joe's plumbing. I just wanted to make sure to differentiate. Yeah, absolutely. That's what I'm yeah. considering. You know, for, for my instance, it's a sedan, so I can respond. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I work for a water company and I need to respond. Um, but I do that, that does bring up a good point. We do have a number of commercial vehicles that are parked on the streets. Um, and so I think there does need to be some kind of, uh, you know, regulation related to that. We, we see considerable amounts of, of, you know, commercial vehicles on the street in the evening throughout the city of Tuscan. Yep. No, I'm very grateful for you to bring that up because it is something the the struggle on the the commercial vehicles and I appreciate the fact that not every car is registered to the address of residents. Um, a good example too is a college student that might be renting a place potentially. I mean those types of things that you know that a car could be registered to their home address as well. So um, right. Okay, that's great. Well, Toby, thank you so much for sharing. We do appreciate it. I'm going to go ahead and mute you for right now, and I will move on to the next hand. And I and I, I want to say, Katya, I'm going to try to unmute you if you uh, can take that invitation if you're getting that. Let's see, Kat, there we okay, go. Katya, uh, can you hear us? Th yeah, thank you. Um, only was supporting the the first gentleman who spoke about the um, uh, Sycamore Street. Uh, I live in here during the 11 years, but I see one problem in this. Well, for example, me, I never have visited because it's a problem to find a car spot outside. And uh, many people have three, four cars during the, I don't know how they use the street, but they are uh, keeping that space for their cars all day and because someone is at home every day. And all, gar all the garages are really full of mess people living in the, in the, uh, the garage. And I think why anybody's doing nothing. I reported all this with management, uh, but you know, they are, do, not, do not have uh, any action. And, and I think it's, it's our, I hope the city can be doing something uh, to speak uh, and can speak with the with the owner's property, they can do something about the situation too, 
And also many people is renting their units to other people and they bring more cars. I have only two cars, but it's a problem all the time with the cars outside. And, and I think that, that oh, thank you, Katya. I think that goes back to one of the points I was trying to make at the beginning too is, you know, apartment buildings aside, our single family homes are now, you know, being resided in by multiple dwellers in a lot of cases. And I think that that's one of the inherent challenges that we have. And this really even goes back to the example of the cul-de-sac that I think um, you and Toby shared is that, you know, the impacts of how many people are living in our homes and even as the, our residents get older and our, our kids get older, you know, that impact of what's happening um, on our streets is definitely being felt um, by many, in fact, most of you. So that's gonna be something that we'll evaluate. But again, I do wanna highlight the one piece of, because of the housing allowances that are allowed in terms of being able to convert your garages and being able to build accessory dwelling units, those are things that I wanna highlight are having an impact on our streets. And it's another reason why we're gonna definitely evaluate this holistically. So thank you, Katya, I appreciate um, your participation. And I see the next hand up is DW is what the screen name says. And hopefully you're receiving, there we go, DW, can you hear me okay? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, please. Hi, um, Julie. My name's Drew, and I uh, am holding my baby right now, so we'll see if he stays quiet. But um, my family and I have lived in Tustin for about six and a half years. Uh, we live in an apartment complex that is near Stater Brothers on Red Hill. Um, and as you may know, there are a lot of apartment complexes in this block. There's a ton on Mitchell. There's a bunch on Nissan. Um, and, and I also uh, park a car on the street. And so I'm familiar with street parking and street sweeping and, um, and I do not have a permit. Um, and so I am only allowed to park in basically on, in our area, it's pretty much Nissan on one side of Red Hill and Nissan on the other um, next to the sound walls of the freeway. Um, I think I just wanted to raise, I guess just my perspective and maybe the perspective of hopefully the people who live near me, um, which I'm, my perspective and hopefully theirs is, is basically we uh, often like maybe a lot of you guys, but we have one guaranteed spot where we live. We have uh, one second spot if there's enough room, right? We kind of have to, there's, if there's open spaces and if you get the open space, it's your second car. And then a third car is not allowed to park on the property. That's, that's the, the rules I think where we live, but there are lots of people uh, who have more than two cars. <laughs> Right, um, and so there are, I think, lots of people parking cars on the street and have to walk a pretty considerable distance. Um, and uh, at night, like I voted, you know, or not voted, but responded that parking is very hard to find at night. There's been a time where I think I maybe even couldn't find it at night, and therefore try to make sure I park earlier. But that can be disruptive to other schedules. Like, oh, I need to stop work right now, and I need to go move my car at 4 p.m. or whatever. Um, so just to say that uh, in our area, there's a bunch of streets along Nissan that are single family homes that have permit requirements. And I'm not saying to get rid of the permit requirement. I don't know what the solution is, but I think a problem that I wanna raise is that there are probably a lot of people who live in uh, condos, apartments, et cetera, who have to walk a considerable distance to find parking. And that if there are ways to now, this may be contrary to the <laughs> desires of other people on this call, but there are if there are ways to expand more streets where we can park, that might be helpful to us, even though that may be at the detriment of someone else's desire. So just to raise that, and thank you. No, Drew, thank you. And I do want to ask you a question um, because you shared something that I want to make sure that we dig in on. When you talked about that you can't park a third car on property, um, my question is um, for the complex like that you've described, are there parking spaces available for the apartment units that you're referring to that go unutilized because of that um, third car rule? Um, so I, I think it sort of depends. The parking cutoff for us is at 10 p.m., I think. Mm -hmm. And so before 10 p.m., uh, sometimes I can't find a second spot here. And we will often drive our first one that has a guaranteed spot and not the other car because we don't wanna lose our spot and not be able to find a parking. Now, if I'm coming home from some event after 10 p.m., it might sometimes be underutilized just a little, 
but man, before 10 p.m., like good luck sometimes, you know, between like 6 p.m. and 10 p.m. So no, thank you for sharing. I will tell you when we went on our ride along, the distances that people are walking um, was actually really shocking um, to see the how far folks are having to walk uh, to park. So I really appreciate that as well. So um, Dixie, uh, let me go to John. I think his hand was up first and then I'll come to you. So John, I'm gonna go ahead and ask to unmute you and thank you, Drew, for your comments. So John, do you wanna go ahead and go next? Yeah, I just had a couple nuts and bolts, sorry. Sure. Um, First off, in the dynamics, what he's referring to, a lot of times people from other neighborhoods will park early in the morning and they'll do that so that they can keep their garage open for a guest. So then around 10 o'clock, like what he's saying, they'll come back to their car, put it into their garage. And so there's a space in the evening, but it doesn't necessarily, in the past, I've been told that that's an excuse not to have a permit parking program, but but that's that's the thing is just because there's a spot in the evening doesn't mean that that spot wasn't filled up from 8 a.m. to 11 right. p.m. So if I'm coming home from work, that's still a parking impact. Right. Um, and, and so the second one is a lot of the single family homes that got approved fast and loose. Their biggest complaint was that they couldn't put their trash bins out in their driveway. Um, enforcement wise, the problem, the easy solution for that would have been to spray lines on the street. Because an officer can't ticket a car, even if it's blocking the driveway, unless they had a marked stall on, on the road. And so for a lot of the single family homes that are complaining about not being able to exit their driveways, the, the five cent solution is to actually paint a parking stall onto you know, their street. So. I'm just going to ask a question, John, just so I can have a little bit of um, more yeah, intelligence yeah. on this. So this aspect of painting lines on the street so yes. it's your understanding that um, without the lines that the blocking a driveway could not be enforced. I just want to make sure I understand Yes, that. this is actually with conversations with Tustin PD. It's why okay. now a lot of streets like Sycamore, Newport, Myrtle, Tustin Village Way have actual um, painted lines because in the old yep. days, somebody would miss purposely mispark their car to shove another person in. And so mm -hmm. that kind of behavior would happen in these single family homes where they would miss park a car on purpose, then pull it back and then shove a second car. Well, that second car is blocking the driveway. And so that per single family home resident would call Tustin PD and they would come over here and they're like, well, you know, I'm not sure I can issue them a ticket. So when I, I did address my concern about people saving spots, they said, unless we have those painted stalls, we can't do anything. And so that's why those were, were, were put throughout the city to help regulate that. So, so that's my comment about single family homes. If that's their only complaint, then doing a painted stall protects them from somebody putting a car and blocking their driveway. Now, thank you for that. And that's actually, I had not heard that bit of feedback. So we'll definitely do some digging mm -hmm. in on that detail as well and see if we can uh, identify mm -hmm. the history on that one. So thank you, John, I appreciate You're it. Welcome. Thanks. Okay, Dixie, I'm coming to you next. I'm gonna to ask to unmute you. Hopefully you're good. There we yeah. go. Dixie, can you hear us okay? Yeah, great. Thank you so much. Sure. Um, yeah, so uh, I bought my house in Tustin um, in 2005 and um, the parking's always been a bit tricky. Um, we are probably the only little street of old town homes on the other side of the freeway. Um, in a little pocket that's surrounded by um, a shopping center and apartments. And um, it's a really tricky, tiny little street where most people have, because we're not under the Heritage Act and all of that, have transformed their garages and put, uh, you know, second little probably illegal dwellings so there's usually more than um, one person who lived in my house was just me for, for years. So the parking on this little street has just been always super awful. Um, and I was excited to see that they're hopefully coming to some solutions because it's just been going on for way too long. Um, people have used cones um, to block off <laughs> their parking spot in front of their house um garages i've seen neighbors getting fights over it i mean it's been really actually a really source of just 
turning the community almost against each other in some ways. Um, and, you know, I just felt like it wasn't fair because I parked my car in the garage, but yet anytime I wanted to have anybody over, they just, there was nowhere they could park legally. Um, so it's just kind of a pain. Uh, I think it makes sense to me, especially because there's so many different needs that I've heard tonight in so many different neighborhoods that have different problems um, that the solution probably isn't the same for each um, <laughs> neighborhood, right. unfortunately. No, um, you're absolutely our right. street in particular, it's very different um, than a lot of the problems I've heard tonight. So um, yeah, I, I would appreciate the fact that I think that um, just also a safety issue, I don't live in the safest part of Tustin, like that it would be nice to have a guaranteed spot um, on the street and maybe a permit, two permits issued to each um, house um, on the street just kind of makes logical sense. Um, I'm not sure if that's the right solution, but I do appreciate you guys looking into this and um, you know doing something about it because um, it's just, honestly, California and our cars, we're just kind of uh, have more cars than the average bear. So um, yeah, it's, it's a shame, but we, we do need um, probably some more regulation. Um, so I appreciate you putting this together and, and looking at some solutions. Uh, it's, we're definitely here because of city staff. So we appreciate the opportunity. But one thing, Dixie, that you said that I said really resonated with me, the one thing people get really passionate about is parking and their cars. <laughs> There's no doubt. So the whole, the cones and the trash cans and the fisticuffs in the street, I have to say, unfortunately, been there, done that. And I can absolutely appreciate that too. So I um, mean, and, and I will say that you highlighted something that I'd love to touch on as we um, go to the next person is there is no one size fits all solution. And I think that that's something that I appreciate that everybody recognizes is that we all have different needs, different priorities, our communities, our neighborhoods all have variances, um, unique factors. So when we try to come up with a comprehensive solution that's really adaptable to Tustin, I think that that's gonna be something that's important. We haven't really heard anybody bring up yet our border cities, but that's something that I know that I'm um, in the case of up against, you know, um, some of our border cities, the spillover impacts for those neighborhoods are also things that we know we have to deal with as well. So um, yeah, this is not one of those easy puzzles to be able to uh, to put together by any means. So we really appreciate your feedback because this is how we're gonna be able to come up with a solution. So thank you so much, Dixie. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, head back to Drew. And Drew, I'm gonna go ahead and unmute you. And let's see, there you go. Drew, can you hear us okay? Yep, can you hear me, Julie? Yes, sir. The one just follow up comment you had mentioned in your introduction before this Q&A, the possibility of using private spaces overnight for public parking. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to mention as an example in my area, I don't know if it would work well, but the Stater Brothers shopping center has a huge parking lot next to the like abandoned gas station and Indian restaurant mm -hmm. that often gets used by uh, like trucks parking there for a while, like like 18 wheelers or whatever. Yep. But there's a ton of parking there that if there was some arrangement the city came to that that could, again, I don't know what problems would come with that. I, I'm not naive to think that no, like a lot of solutions have a problem. So I don't know what the problem is, but that just to raise that, that, that could be one thing that would be helpful. Um, and then of course, on the other side of the freeway, there's, there's the big lots shopping center where there's a mm -hmm. ton of parking as well. Um, so Anyways, just to highlight that. No, you, you hit it on the head. And in fact, since you asked that, I'll just bring up a couple of comments about that so folks can understand that this is actually what has uh, solved for um, some of the impacts, especially in some of our denser areas. Um, my colleague, Allison, who's here helping host this meeting, she actually lives in a suburb of Chicago. And having worked in the neighborhood that she lives in, I can tell you that a lot of the properties where Allison lives were built well before any of us were born and were built in some cases before cars existed. And so the concept of driveways and garages is a non-issue. So in her neighborhoods, you know, not only do we have the housing density, there's no driveways, there's no garages. So that community had to leverage the school parking lots, the church parking lots, the bank parking lots in order to make it work. 
And so I can tell you that these types of solutions exist in other communities and they actually work quite effectively. And Drew, to your point, you know, if this is a solution that can work in Tustin because of the technology and somebody earlier mentioned license plate recognition technology, there's tools that the city can be equipped with in order to manage programs like that so that private property owners can share their parking um, and in some cases have a revenue source associated with that. So for an affordable parking permit, but then the city can ultimately help manage that program. But what it really comes down to is that I, as a, a, a resident, if I qualify for one of those permits, if I violate the rules, for example, we're using maybe the school parking lot, for example, if I don't get out of that parking space by 7 a.m. on the school days, um, I lose my parking permit privileges as well as potentially could have my car towed. Those are kind of the buy-ins that you have to be able to participate or have the privilege of parking in a location like that. And I'll tell you that those rules um, to be able to have a kind of good neighbor policy, it does work really well in other communities. And I would anticipate that that's probably going to be one of the paths that we're going to pursue. What's really neat is we've had some stakeholders who've already stepped up and actually suggested their properties to be able to provide that resource. So I won't say that it'll solve for every problem, but this is gonna be a combo platter without a doubt of being able to find solutions that are gonna work um, for each neighborhood as well. And I see Jessica, thank you for sharing uh, the location. I actually believe when we were on our ride along, we went past that specific location. Um, I don't see any more hands up, but I did want to take a moment here to see um, if anybody who hasn't participated yet um, was interested in providing any comments or thoughts. Oh, I see Drew. I'm going to unmute you there. Let's see. Sorry, there sorry, for there like, sorry for triple dipping here. Just, yeah, um, go for it. Um, I don't know if I heard brought up on this call street sweeping. Is that something that is also being considered? I thought it was part of the survey like basically like what hours of street sweeping are perhaps more or less convenient. I'd love um, to hear your feedback on it streets. I mean, basically anything that involves the residential streets and parking permits and street sweeping is one of those impacts. So what do you got to say on that one? Sure, so one like broad comment is just what time of day, but then sort of the more and day of the week, but the more complex one is like making sure that nearby streets or are not put on the same days and times because that's a problem we have on Nissan. Um, literally, I think on the, the one side of the freeway, I think it's all Monday. Both sides of the street are all Monday and the other side is Wednesday. So at least there is a break between the two sides. But on that one day, like that whole side of the freeway is, is gone. And so that makes a major impact, I think, on the other side. So maybe there could be and, and other people may have a similar situation, but just mm -hmm. basically reevaluating based on numbers of cars being parked now versus whenever the rules were made prior of like, hey, maybe we switch to some different days or modify some of the days to uh, alleviate some local impact where it's like, oh man, there's nothing nearby here. There's right. way not enough cars. So that's all. No, great feedback. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. Okay, John, I see your hand up and well, hopefully that mute unmute well there you go john can okay. you hear us i can hear you can you hear me yes sir okay i just want to since you did touch up on the whole uh um companies being able to use the their parking spaces um one there's two areas there's the church but what i want the saint cecilius church and then what i wanted to focus a little bit on is sycamore magnet academy um because right now the entire school it's got parking on all four sides, or sorry, three sides. Um, it's kind of used for a lot of uh, dumping ground for cars. So it's, it's kind of like that weird thing of like, okay, this is, this is a public asset. Um, so I don't know if, if they, they should get money out of it for charging. Um, but, but definitely as, as things start to normalize, the impacts that are going to happen are on the pony baseball and sports teams that play there. Um, also the pickleball players that like to go there all the time. So, so that area also separately needs to be worked up because right now that's where some of the vehicles that are being left for weeks on end tend to reside because there's no residents, there's no apartments. It's easy for someone to dump cars there for a long period of time. 
Got it. I see exactly where you're talking about. And the one thing when we talk about um, like revenue generated, in some cases, it's just strictly to pay for the program or like the assets associated with like the LPR, things like that too. So thank you for that comment. And Chester, I see your note in the uh, comment section and hopefully that will allow you to unmute yourself if you're getting an invitation. There you go. Oh, thank you. Uh, just wanted to know, I know everything is gonna eventually get done by the beginning of next year, but at, at present time, do we all get one parking permit, Please. at least one parking permit per household? Well, so the permit rules vary by the neighborhood in which you live in. And so what I would suggest we can do, Chester, and I believe I saw you put your comments in the, um, in the chat box, I uh, will coordinate with city staff to be able to follow up with you so that we can make sure that you're well informed about what the permit regulations are for where you live, if that's okay. Thank you so much. No problem. Thank you so much for participating. Uh, just while we're taking a moment to see if anybody has any other uh, questions or comments, I'm going to ask my colleague Christy to share the screen because I wanted to be sure that everybody who's here tonight has this information for reference. Um, so as we, and Dixie, I'll come back to you as, oh, may I please have that too? So Dixie, we'll make sure, I think you put your um, contact information. If not, if you'll make sure Allison has that, uh, we can coordinate that follow-up. And also um, on the screen now, everybody should see, um, we actually have contact information for not only Chris, uh, who is our host tonight from uh, Public Works, so from city staff, but we also have our contact email address as well, um, so that if you have any follow-up or anything in terms of action following tonight's meeting, please don't hesitate to utilize that information. And we actually already have the Zoom link set aside for the next meeting um, on October 28th. We'll be sure that this information is also posted uh, via the city, as well as we'll leverage any of your email addresses to be able to send out um, information. I promise you we won't spam you, but we want to make sure that we can keep you all engaged in the communications and processes as we're moving forward. And at the next meeting, we'll be culling all of the details associated with the surveys, the feedback you've given us tonight, any follow-up actions that we have, and that's where we'll actually have the preliminary recommendations. Um, and really talking through some of those details. Um, please don't hesitate. If you know of a location that you think would be ideal for a shared parking location, don't hesitate to drop us a note and tell us where that location is. And if you know the property owner or anything like that, we're always happy to uh, reach out and have those conversations. Um, like I mentioned, we're trying to be as real as possible um, in terms of being able to put together a holistic plan and approach. Um, I do appreciate everybody's candor tonight. And I really truly appreciate the fact that everybody appreciates that, you know, we all have our priorities, we all have our needs and, you know, our neighborhoods are different. And so, you know, just, I really do, people are passionate about parking and I just really want to acknowledge how respectful you've all been um, on our different needs. I'm going to go ahead and uh, ask for one last call. Anybody have any other comments, any other hands to raise, um, any other feedback? Um, I want to be mindful and respectful of everybody taking time out of their evening for us. And I thank you as well, Dixie. I would just again want to tell everybody, I uh, really do thank you all um, for your time this evening and again, your feedback. Um, even when critical, um, this is the only way we can uh, make a difference. You know, we like to rip the band-aids off and get to the root cause in order to have these conversations. And uh, we'll definitely do what we can uh, so that we meet next time on August 28th. That will have hopefully some really promising recommendations so that we can work with staff on bringing that to council. There was one thing I think Chester mentioned too that I really wanna be realistic is if we go to council by end of the year, beginning of next year, um, in terms of implementation and deployment and rollout, you know, the magic wand is not real. So uh, things don't happen overnight. Um, but I just ask that everybody recognize that we are trying to, you know, move the needle, um, move things forward. And so that collaboration with everybody is going to be so key and so critical. So I haven't seen any other hands raised. Uh, we do have all of the contact information out of the chat box. And on behalf of the city staff, on behalf of Dixon, I just really want to thank all of you for taking the time to participate tonight. And again, uh, take note of those email addresses and we'll look forward to hopefully seeing and hearing from all of you on October 28th. So with that, 
I'll bid you adieu and have a very good night. And uh, thank you very much all for uh, participating. Everybody, thank you so much. Bye-bye.